Hey, it's time for VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk. We got all sorts of cool stuff to start the uh, the first 2021 Tech Talk of the year. What do we got to talk about tonight? We've got lots of Mac stuff, right? I, I know. A lot of Mac stuff. <laughs> Let me know as soon as there's something interesting to talk about on Windows, and I'm happy to. But it's a lot of Mac stuff. Talking about the Apollo, it's supported on Mac, but also about... Some other ways to record voiceover if you don't have a booth. Think about using your car much? Wow, interesting point. And we're going to talk about the difference between recording music and re recording voice tracks. So stay tuned for that. Plus, your questions that have been sent in on VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk will be right back after this. Hello. Hello. Welcome, Welcome to VoiceOver voice Body Shop. It's a place where you can get your body shopped with voices. Come on. Look at Dan's head. So shiny. Here's some big news from VoiceOverEssentials.com. They're now hosted on Shopify, the leading cloud-based solution for online stores and retail point-of-sale systems. It powers over 600,000 businesses and has more than $82 billion in sales. VoiceOver Essentials has been hard at work getting all their ducks in a row for the transition and converted over the holiday, and they couldn't be happier. They can accept virtually any type of payment from all major credit cards, PayPal, Shopify Pay, Apple Pay, Square, and even cryptocurrency. Plus, they can ship more efficiently and often and save customers money on shipping costs because they instantly see what's the best bet for their customers that day across all delivery providers, including DHL for shipments internationally. They'll be spending way less time coding and tweaking their freestanding VOE sites so they can devote more time to customer service, new products, and more helpful resources for the VO home studio world. VoiceOverEssentials.com is a great company, too. From Nescafe and Tesla to Sephora, Bombas, the New York Times, and Wikipedia, Shopify is the place to be. VoiceOverEssentials.com well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big-voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? Stick around. You don't want to miss this. Look what you made me do. Power 103.9. At Target, we want you to come as you are. Be comfortable. Uh, okay, maybe not bathrobe comfortable. Pants for the customer in aisle four, please. Nuevo México necesita un cambio. La representante Michelle Lujan Grisham ha luchado por nuestro estado en la Cámara de Representantes. Watch anywhere, anytime on an unlimited number of devices. Sign in with your Netflix account to watch instantly at Netflix.com. The ice cream maker is a big risk that can have huge rewards until you forget to turn it on. Well, that's it, guys. Time is up. Hey, it's JMC. Thanks for watching the VoiceOver Body Shop. If you're demo ready or looking to get there, check out jmcdemos.com and see a sample of our work. Now let's get back to Dan and George and this week's tech wisdom. Boom, this is where I get to talk about Source Elements. Source Elements, the creators of Source Connect and so, so, so many other products. It's crazy how many things they're doing because they're, they're trying to innovate and solve a lot of problems that we're facing now working from home. I mean, not only are you the actors working from home, the whole production is oftentimes working from home. And for them to be able to record, remotely direct, share, share video streams all at the same time, do it securely, and send that video to other studios around the world all at the same time, they're really the only ones that have all of the tools to do this and the knowledge on how to set it all up. But basically, what you need to know is one thing as a voice actor, and that is Source Connect. Get it set up, get it running, learn how to use it, and have it under your belt because you want to be ready. As we say, the luck that luck favors the prepared. So you want to be prepared when those opportunities come. So go ahead and get yourself a trial at source-elements.com of Source Connect. They even have ways to do licensing by the month. And even by the, I think, two day. So you can ask them about that. Just send them an email at support at sourceelements.com. And also, if you just want to get up and running with minimal fuss and you want to see some help on how to do it, go to George the Tech, George the dot tech slash SC, where I've got a whole bunch of information on setting up Source Connect. But anyway, you should have it so you're ready to go. Connect to studios around the world. Don't make any more excuses. There's no reason not to be ready. Anyway, thanks for listening. Let's get on with Tech Talk. From the outer reaches, they came, bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together, from the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you. 
Now, George Widom, the engineer to the VO stars, a Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master, a professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week, they allow you into their world, making the complex simple, debunking the myths of what it takes to create great sounding audio, answering your questions, showing you the latest and greatest in VO tech, and having a dandy time doing it. Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk. VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, remote studio connections for everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt, VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training, J. Michael Collins Demos, when quality matters, and VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Well, hi there. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop or VO BS. Tech talk. Tech talk. Tech talk. Tech talk. I think I screwed up that cue, but yeah, it doesn't matter. You know, it's you know, talk. it's time for tech talk. Tech talk. <laughs> it's time for tech, tech talk. talk. Yes, our first tech talk of twenty twenty one. Going to be a great year for voiceover. I just get that feeling. But it's interesting to note that twenty twenty was a very busy year for you and I because everybody had to have a home voiceover studio. We kept telling That's you, sure. you got to have a home studio, but no. It's like, no, I'm talent. I go into somebody's... St well, that stopped. You know, it didn't stop on a dime. It stopped at a brick wall. I'm in Hollywood. Yeah, and your point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, so, the fact of the matter is, if you need a home studio, you can talk to musicians, you can talk to all sorts of people, you can talk to recording engineers. They aren't in your closet. They are not in your home. They don't understand the unique totally unique and by the way unique to you environment in which you record because as george and i will tell you the most important part of your home voiceover studio is the environment in which you record and we keep saying mm -hmm. you got to try this equipment you got to try that equipment you got to try this this is making me if your acoustics are bad you could have a ten thousand dollar microphone and you will hear just about everything within a 10 mile radius uh, that's not what voiceover is about. Voiceover is a very, very specific thing. It's not hard. It's not technical. And the only way you're going to learn how to do it is from the guys who actually know how to do it. And that's Mr. Whittem and myself. And you can, you can talk to all sorts of people. You can go on the Facebook forums. If you ask lots of questions, you will get lots of different answers. If you ask questions of George and I, you will get the right answer because we know that stuff right yeah i mean you know there is there are answers that are there's always more than one right answer right right but the right answer we're going to give you is distilled down from years and years of working with thousands of voice actors down to really the essentials of what you guys need to know and, and the way to do it and the most cost effective way to do it yeah. That's where, you know, the value comes into investing some time with Dan or I. So if you want to work with me, you can head over to georgethe.tech. That's my website. Sure. Hopefully it will be a new one uh, or a, a very soon after you see this. Uh, we have we have a new site that's being built as we speak and finishing, getting finished. Um, but you'll be able to book services there and send files to get analyzed and processing stacks and all that kind of stuff at georgethe.tech and Dan's website. Also where you can book him and get services from him is at homevoiceoverstudio.com. 
easy enough to find and easy enough to spell, just all one word. Uh, yeah, and if you go there, you'll see the, the type of services I offer. One thing that I think everybody should at least do is use my specimen collection cup at the very bottom of my homepage because you click on that, it's a Dropbox. Send me a sample of your raw audio. People keep sending me, oh, I'm using all this processing. Send me your raw audio. Let's see if it sounds good to start with. Then you start to futz with it. It's amazing how many people are like always trying to, I got to manipulate it. What, you don't, that's, you don't, we don't talk to people through EQ and compression and all these things. So send me a raw sample, $25. I will give you a very thorough analysis of how your audio sounds and maybe some recommendations to get it sounding the way it should. Most of the time it sounds pretty good, but sometimes it's like, eh, you know, there's a little bit of this, there's a little bit of that. Here's how we can correct that. And so that's why we're here at VoiceOver Body Shop to tell you that that's what George and I do. It has been for the last right. 10 years. That was the whole point. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> anyway, so what's in your tech update this week? Well, uh, real quickly, um, an update on uh, anybody who's been thinking about buying a new, new, new Mac. I went to Big Sur on all my computers. So you went to Big Sur. Okay. Yep. You took the plunge and everything's fine, I'm hoping. Yeah, a couple little weird things, but nothing major. Anything you might care to mention about the weird things? Anything? <laughs> I, I, I think it has more to do with, with um, I actually, it's more with Google, I think. Oh. <laughs> you know, and, and various other things. Or Actually, the one thing that I found is that AirDrop is gone from my, main, from, from my laptop, but not on my main. Oh, really? How do you add AirDrop into the, into the menu there? That's the only thing I've noticed so far. Oh, like on the favorites on the left-hand right. side, AirDrop right. just isn't there anymore? Right. I can't remember. There's probably a drag-and-drop kind of thing you have to do to get it to show up in there, or maybe it's in under Finder Preferences. I, I'm i not really sure. Yeah. If that's the biggest quirk you're dealing with, that's ain't, that ain't so bad. No. I, have, I never have trouble when I move from OS. It's... <laughs> that's really good. You're very lucky. Um, the, the Apollo is not only supporting... Well, Apollo is... The Apollo is officially supporting Big Sur. So if you've been waiting to install Big Sur, and I'm still not saying run out and install Big Sur yet, but if you just gotta, it's supposedly going to be supported, no issues with Apollo now. Um, there's still a process for um, installing it. That's quite a, quite a lot of steps. So if you're installing it new on a Big Sur computer, be ready. There's a lot of steps and you got to follow all of them for it to work. But it also unofficially supports the new M1 Mac. So I was actually able to do, an, uh, would do a quick test with my old Apollo twin here. Yes, yes, the original old school silver one from back in, this is probably six, seven years old. Um, that does work on the M1. And I say officially because uh, there's a little hack you have to get to, you have to run to make it work. That's like, feels like you're hacking your computer. And... If something goes wrong, Universal Audio will not help you. So it is not officially supported, but it does physically work. So if you're a real early adopter and you want to get a new Mac and you use Apollo stuff, you can dabble in making that happen. Um, now, something about the new M1 silicon-based Macs I've been wanting to mention again, and I may have hit, I may have already hammered this home, but it's such a no-brainer. Um, and such a big deal in the world of computing and why I think it's such a no brainer for a VO studio now more than ever is that it has never been more like sort of like an appliance. And if you're a computer builder, a gamer, or someone that likes customization, this is the polar opposite of what you're looking for in a computer. If you're a producer, a, a, a voice actor, engineer who wants an appliance that just works, that's built it completely custom built to run an operating system, Mac OS, and do it flawlessly and do it efficiently, quietly, with a long battery life. Nothing touches the new Mac M1 silicon chip based computers. It is remarkable. They're super efficient, battery efficient, don't get hot. To sit on my lap and casually edit a 1080p video I was working on and not have my laptop burn my legs is pretty amazing stuff. And yes, you can do that 
with an M1 Max. So it's it's an incredibly powerful machine that runs silent. Finally, a proper Mac that isn't a compromise in terms of performance and power resources that um, that is actually capable of doing anything you would possibly need for voiceover. Don't let the specs in any way fool you. You know, you look at the numbers and go, eight gigs of memory. Oh, I can't do anything with less than 16. Trust me, this is a whole different architecture, a whole different deal. And it is far, far more efficient. And uh, until there's a Windows equivalent of what this computer is and does and how it integrates with the OS, I'm going to continue to beat the Apple drum because it really, really does what it does so, so well because of that custom built chip inside custom made for Apple by Apple and made to run that operating system and nothing else. There's just something to it. That integration that is just can't be touched. So good, good to consider know. it, I've... consider it. And don't say that price is a big deal anymore. 699 bucks for a Mac mini M1. Really? With 700 with, bucks. With only with, with eight gigs of RAM. Eight gigs of RAM, and I, I'm not, I know it sounds low, but it it isn't in the context of a Silicon Mac. It is a whole different ball game because it's a completely new system architecture. So um, consider it if you if you're running systems that can run on Mac, so you're using Adobe Audition or Pro Tools, or you want to even try Logic or a uh, Twisted Wave. This is this is the the time to do it. So. Anyway, I'll finish my Apple rant and by or Apple whatever by talking about the AirPod Max cuz people always ask about it. It is still even at $550 for these amazingly engineered beautiful beautifully designed and by all reports good sounding headphones. Don't consider them for anything more than just fun casual music listening. That's they expensive are still, music listening. They sure are. <laughs> They are, they are amazingly built, really apparently high, very comfortable and have some incredibly cool engineering tricks up their sleeves. But when it comes to doing production, if you need to monitor yourself real time for singing, voiceover, you know, working with production, um, doing lip sync, uh, uh, animation, anything where you have to hear yourself or hear something else in real time, it ain't going to do it because it's Bluetooth. There is latency with a Bluetooth wireless headphone signal. You just can't do anything that has to be perfectly in sync when you're using Bluetooth headphones. And well, that's what these are. Now, for a while, I've been thinking like, how could we do, well, first of all, what would be the benefit to having wireless headphones in a voiceover booth? And I know a lot of people find it really irritating that their microphone cable is moving around, whacking into things, sometimes getting tangled in itself. It just, it's another irritant. And I've thought about for a while, the idea that a wireless headphone could someday be a part of a voiceover studio. And um, bizarrely, nobody, I guess because it's a problem looking for a solution or is it the other way around? A solution looking for a problem. Yeah. <laughs> it hasn't really happened yet. But um, if that's something that sounds interesting to you, I have my own ideas. I won't bore you right now. But reach out to me, um, send us a message at the guys at VOBS.tv if that interests you. And um, I have my ideas on how that could be done properly. But um, anyway, yeah, that idea of being wireless in the booth and feeling untethered is uh, something that you can't do with Bluetooth. Ain't going to work. Good. Lastly, yes, VO in the car. Dan, have you tried to or attempted or had any reason to record any voiceover work in a car? Oh, absolutely. What, What's the scenario that you ran into most recently? Uh, well, I remember it was 110 degrees. And I <laughs> couldn't, of course, run, run the car in the air conditioning, you know, and you're sweating profusely. The, the trick, I mean, I have found that if you're going to do it in the car, generally you can get away with an audition or something along those lines. And I, and I use my iPhone and I have the script here and I don't talk directly into the mic and you can get away with it. I mean, if you're using Twisted Wave on your phone or something. And uh, so that's the ultimate minimalist. I got to get something recorded right now. I don't have any gear with me. Exactly. But maybe I can pull this off. And I have. And, and it's worked. And so I don't, I don't concern myself with it too much. 
I'd say if you're on the road and you do have to produce something and say you've got an Epigee mic with you or you've got your road rig with you of some sort, a car is a good place. Uh, people don't realize that, you know, these car manufacturers spend more than hundreds of thousands. They spend millions of dollars in research trying to design their cars to be acoustically so you can have a conversation quietly in the fact that you're in a car, but also hear the siren that's coming up behind you. Uh, but other than that, the exterior noise is greatly reduced, but the acoustics inside are generally very, very good. Uh, as good as, as many booths. But just don't do it next to a, a fire station. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of us aren't going to be on the road. So, I mean, unless you're doing road trips, which I guess some of us are, actually. I just did. But if you're at home, why would you want to record in the car if you're at home? Well, I mean, <laughs> I actually have a client who told me that they're doing it from home because the only way, uh, doing it from the garage from home, I should say, because it's the only way they can find a place quiet enough to get away from the family and get clean audio. And, and I have another case that just came up recently. One of our fans of the show, actually, Nathan Carlson, he's got two daughters. One of them's going off into college, believe it or not, physically going off to college right now and she does voiceover work and the idea of trying to pull off a voiceover audition let alone a job from a dorm room with a roommate oh with the roommate yeah like it's pretty next to impossible yeah. or slice you know possibly mortifying and embarrassing to a 19 18 year old girl so i talked to nathan we put together a kit using a shotgun mic i think i mentioned a road shotgun mic and uh in that case, I think we were actually the one that he ended up getting based on our recommendation was one of these little mic port pros, the two. And um, she's got a kit she can use in the back seat of her car. And actually, if you go on, speaking of road, go on YouTube, type in road voiceover in car. They actually have a really good video about this topic. They, It's not just a promotional fluffy video. They really show techniques, how to set it up, where to be in the car and get good audio. And Makes a lot of sense. They have you in the back seat between the two, with the mic between the two headrests, as far away from the windows as possible. So that's what I recommended to Nathan. So this is another way to pull off a session when you have the family home and you just can't get a space quiet enough. You don't, you haven't made the investment or you just don't have the space or budget for an ISO booth yet. And you've got that big critical session coming. Um, Lastly, I had a client who actually ran a mic cable and a headphone extension from his <laughs> studio through the house into the garage and out to the car. So he's hardwired into the house, literally. No, nothing to worry about with the internet dropping out because he's wired into his studio. And that's how he pulls off Source Connect sessions from his car. So where there's a will, there's a way. And, and you can get good audio that way. Yeah. The nicer the car, the nicer the audio. That is absolutely true. As Dan was saying, you know, the, the car, the companies that spend a lot of money on the design of the interior, the acoustics and the soundproofing are going to be the luxury car companies for sure. Yeah. So the better quality, more modern, higher end cars are going to make a probably help a lot. So, yeah. yeah. So buy a Lexus. Probably not a 73 Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> no. Hey, well, I don't know. We have to try it out in the 73 Volkswagen Beetle. That is true. Because there are plenty so. around here in California. Yes. You know, if I you've done this, <laughs> please let us know. <laughs> anyway. Oh, my God. Yes. Yeah, so. That's it for all my tech talk updates. That's, that's, that's plenty. But, you know. Do I play a song now? Do I play like... All right. I guess I was supposed to play at the, be at the beginning, but no, beginning. better late than never. Ne next week, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Okay. Okay. So here's what, I, what? here's what I wanted to talk about tonight. Because this is something I run into all the time, and I know you probably do as well. And that is the fact that there is a difference between recording music and recording voiceover tracks. And when people are getting started... They asked their musician friends, how do you record your stuff? And they're like, well, you need this and you need that. You need that and you need this. We use compression and we use all these things because we want to create and mold this sound, right. which, which has diddly squat to do with doing voiceover tracks. <laughs> yeah. 
And so what happens is a lot of people end up going down technological rabbit holes because they ask somebody who is more familiar with recording music than recording voiceover tracks. It's not really the same thing. And I'll give you a good demonstration of why. Please do. The first reason is people who are vocalists, and we have lots of friends who also sing and are very good singers. A lot of voice actors also ab ab sing, they, sing. They, they absolutely do because they have great voices. But there's a, and watch, watch my levels on this because this is the whole point. If I'm singing, if I'm singing, I am singing loud. And, you know, I was thinking of doing a, an Andrew Bocelli number, but I can't remember the, you know, how exactly how it went. But when you're singing, you're using the same microphone. All of this equipment was all designed for making music, except perhaps this particular microphone, the Harlan Hogan VO1A. Um, the fact of the matter is, is when you're singing, you're putting out a lot of S. P L sound pressure levels and you don't have to ride the gain so high on your interface because it's going to pick you up just fine but because voiceover is a conversation and i and we tell our clients this all the time you're not talking unless you're doing a promo for a football game at a football game you're not talking to a thousand people you're talking like i'm talking to you right now we're just having a conversation about you know, voiceover in this particular situation. But we're not really yelling. We're not projecting. We're using our indoor voice in our conversation. And therefore, you have to turn the gain much higher up in order to get the proper modulation. And people tend to... That's the other thing, is people don't understand how to set levels. But I think that's a discussion for another time. Uh Music is, is a, all this stuff was designed for making music, especially a lot of the software, because when you look at Pro Tools and Logic and, you know, maybe a little bit of Adobe Audition, although it was really more designed for making, really syncing voice tracks with video um, or, or Reaper or some of these other multi-track systems, voiceover really was not in consideration what happens is a lot of engineers say well i use pro tools so people think well that must sound better when in reality no it's what they use to take your nice dry voice tracks and make you sound right on top of music and sound effects and all that other stuff that's not your job your job is to create a single track mono properly modulated track with proper acoustics and no modulation no overmodulation, and and that's it. And I think people tend to really overthink it because of all of the variables that the software and all of this equipment tends to throw into the whole mix of things, and people get confused. Yeah, and that's a big part of it. And then there's just a few other things that I concern myself with when people ask me about. I'd like to record now some singing from my booth, um, and those that have tried doing this know what I'm talking about is it sounds like a, a voiceover Both booth tuned for voiceover <laughs> sounds pretty good for voiceover if it's tuned right or great but for singing it's so incredibly clinically dead that it's very weird sounding for the performer now yes you can fix it in post you can add reverb and you can create an acoustical environment later that's what you know people that know how to use their software and no audio engineering can do but for the live performance, the actual time you're performing to be singing in that extremely dead vacuum, anechoic space that you've created, it can be really difficult for the performer. So that's definitely another major consideration is it can be just really hard to get a nice singing performance out of that um, environment. So sometimes you have to create it from scratch. Now, most gear doesn't do that very elegantly. It requires much more production skill. But if you find yourself wanting to do this more often, the Yamaha AG03 is one of the few products that have that capability built in for not a lot of money. About 150 bucks for an AG03. There's an effects unit in there with reverb. And the beauty of it is you can hear yourself through that reverb, sort of karaoke style, but still record yourself dry without the reverb. 
which is pretty important. You don't necessarily want that reverb that's part of your performance to be in the recording. Something like an AGO3 can do this super, super easily. Um, at the higher end of the things of price range, there's certainly the Apollo. That can do it as well. But for a quarter of the price and way less complicated. Quarter of the price, yeah. Price, yeah, yeah, the yeah. Yamaha AGO3 will do that kind of stuff in, sp in spades. So if you feel like you're going to be doing a lot of that, I recommend it. Get Check one of those out. They're really such a versatile little piece of gear. Yeah. yeah. We actually run part of our audio through it. If people only knew all of the different interfaces that are running this show. It's pretty it, amazing. It, it, we, everything we talk about, we use on some level on this show. <laughs> really? Yeah. So why, why are there so many different microphones? And that's, I think that's the other issue here about with all of these microphones were designed for different purposes. You know, like, you know, like say an RE20 was originally designed as a bass drum mic. And, you know, and, <laughs> and, and the, the Sennheiser 416 is designed as a video mic. We're just adapting all this stuff to our purposes. It's true. It's true. The, I, and by the way, I just started the Facebook feed. For anybody who cares, the Facebook feed is now live. Yay. Yay. Oh, thanks, Sue. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, a lot of gear we repurpose. And, and a lot of gear is just good at a lot of different things. Nowadays, when you see a new condenser mic coming out, they'll say, this mic works great on guitars, drums, vocals. It's like, yeah, I know. Cause Voice over? guess what? A good, a good <laughs> microphone can record a lot of things. You'll almost never see them say voiceover unless they're marketing to voiceover, which there's very few who do that other than Harlan Hogan's VO1A, which is right above your head. So um, by, the, by the way, just a little plug for that, mic. Yeah. Shootout recently, a client of mine had one of these as well as a uh, the much loved, and I've talked about it a lot, the Vanguard V4 which I thought is a really nice mic. Very nice mic. And um, I think it was a, gosh. Oh, it's not just any client. I believe this was actually a shootout done by the, our very own and loved Jack DeGolia. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> he uh, did a shootout and, and the VO1A won out. It beat out the much newer, more fancy Vanguard V4 and... Uh, and one of the things that it was better than the, all the other mics in the test was its self noise. It was actually the quietest. It's a very quiet mic. Yeah. It had the least amount of room uh, room noise out of that all out of those three mics. I think the other one was a Studio Project C1. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, microphones designed for voiceover, not always just branding. That mic sounds excellent on a voice, and it is very quiet, which is an inc incredibly important aspect of a voiceover mic. Exactly. And that's our discussion for the week on that. We got a bunch of questions. Yes. Uh, some left over from 2020. Uh, and if you've got a question for us, throw it in the, uh, well, chat room and Facebook and on uh, YouTube, if you happen to be there as well. Uh, and we'll be right back to talk about those questions and answer them, hopefully with the right answers, after this. Hello. Hello. Welcome, Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop. It's a place where you can get your body shopped with voices. Come on, look at Dan's head, so shiny. In these modern times, every business needs a website. When you need a website for your voice acting business, there's only one place to go. Like the name says, voiceactorwebsites.com. Their experience in this niche webmaster market gives them the ability to quickly and easily get you from concept to live online in a much shorter time. When you contact voiceactorwebsites.com, their team of experts and designers really get to know you and what your needs are. They work with you to highlight what you do. Then they create an easily navigable website for your potential clients to get the big picture of who you are and how your voice is the one for them. Plus, voiceactorwebsites.com has other great resources like their practice script library and other resources to help your voiceover career flourish. Don't try it yourself. Go with the pros. VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. When it comes to voiceover, the mental game of auditioning is just awful for some people. Yet for others, it's one of the best parts of their day. Now, how do you get your mind in the right place? Here's a link to a free three-lesson mini-course given by this guy. 
Yeah, you recognize him, but you don't know his name. It's TV, film, stage, and voiceover actor Michael Kostroff, an expert at teaching the mental game of auditioning. He's created a free mini-course with the help of VO Heroes called Audition Myths, Tough Truths, and Logic, and it gives you dozens of tested strategies for approaching and nailing the audition process. It works for voiceover, on-camera, theater, commercial, or any other audition you might get. And again, it's absolutely free. Here's the link. VOHeroes.com forward slash V-O-B-S. Yep, VOHeroes.com forward slash V-O-B-S. Go there and you'll get instant access to audition myths, tough truths, and logic. That's VOHeroes.com forward slash V-O-B-S. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez. And you're enjoying Dan and George on The Voice of Everybody, Everybody Show. Show. And we're back. Yes, bum, bum, bum. Bum, da, 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 da. We're working on getting music to come in and out as we do this sort of thing. All right, play play the theme again. There we go. And we are back on Voice Over Body Shop. Yeah, gotta fade it out just a little bit. That's the wrong theme. Next time I'll play the right theme. Okay, good. That our actual theme. Our actual theme. Okay, good. All right. So we got a couple of questions here from our vast audience. From Bob Leadham, uh, it says, is loopback the same as or different than mix minus? Not, hmm. not exactly. Good question. Yeah. Mix minus is sort of like it's a built-in feature on a mixer. Loopback is no, it's something completely different, really. It's getting sound back from your computer yeah i mean they're related like if you're going to do a loop back you want to make sure that there is a mix minus because <laughs> so basically what that means is like what's coming back from the computer you don't want it to go uh let's see returning from the computer right you don't want that to go back to the computer again right because that truly is a loop and that's what's kind of weird. The terminology of a loop back implies that a loop sort of implies a circle, like a continue, continuous loop, round and round and round and round, right? And that's not what we want either. Um, to further confuse things, the AGO3 mixer I just mentioned- I was mentioned about to say, the AGO3 has- Has a switch called loop back. And, and if you, you can use it, but if you do have your stuff set up wrong, it will do exactly that, continue looping, looping around and around and around. So a mix minus is like some mixers have it built in as like a feature you turn on, like the Rodecaster Pro I have literally has a mix minus mode. But essentially what mix minus means is it's a, a mix of everything you want minus the thing you don't want. That's what a mix minus is. So it's a, it's a mix of everything coming in, but the thing, let's say you're on a phone, telephone, you don't want to send the caller himself. So you make a mix. That's everything they need to hear minus himself. That's what a mix minus is. So I think that these terms are all intermingled a lot and they can sort of relate to each other, but they're, that they technically are different things. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they're different devices and stuff. So yeah. 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 And yeah. Don't worry about a mix minus unless you have a mixer. So. Right. I mean, you can't make a mix minus without a mixer to do a mix minus. Essentially, you need something to create that mix situation. Right. Or a mix master, which will make really <laughs> nice brownies. Uh, <laughs> J. Horace Black has a bunch of questions here because J. Horace Black always has good questions. Uh, just in case you didn't get my emailed question with image, I didn't see the image. Hey, Dan and George. First question. Universal Apollo console app. That allows one to operate the interface control, such as gain, monitor, etc. On the far left, there is an analog one. Uh, the lever on the bottom left is on eight. Oh, the analog is lever is one on the lever. Okay. I'm not exactly sure what he's saying there. On the far left, there is a analog one. The lever on the bottom one left is, is on, on eight. eight. Should the level control be on 12 or max to the top? Well, I guess that sort of depends. Yeah, I'm not super clear on the way the question's worded, but if you're talking about the... So on the physical unit, 
which I have right here. Just happened There's to a have. ring of LEDs here. And as you turn the gain up, the ring of LEDs start lighting up more and more and more, indicating that you're increasing the gain. So it just gives you a relative idea of where the gain is set to. And where that should be depends completely on what you're doing, your performance, how from the mic you are, all that kind of stuff. Now in the console, those settings are mirrored in the console app itself, but in the console app, they're nice enough to give you an actual number to go by, which is the gain. So not just a generic set of LED lights, but you can see 43, for example, dB gain. So the two are, and the two are completely connected to each other. So when you turn this knob, that number goes up and down. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's, uh, hopefully that helps somebody. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. are there any basic settings we or I should have on my console? Well, basic settings for if you're just getting started is just make sure your phantom power is turned on. So your phantom power light should be lit. You, you should almost always have the high pass or low cut button on. Usually helps. Um, make sure preamp mode is turned on. So when you turn the knob, you're actually adjusting your gain. But on the console side, you don't need much going on there. You just want to make sure that you can hear playback and monitor yourself. So as long as the level is turned up on your microphone in the console and you don't change any other settings, mess around under the hood, play with a bunch of other stuff, then you'll hear yourself and you'll hear uh, playback in your headphones. Right. And that's beyond the, that. Right. And that's the thing with the Apollo is that console isn't designed for voiceover unless you're really experienced and really know what it is that you're adding in there. It's very much music. It's it's or very engineering much. related, yeah. Yeah, and and therefore, you know, the console is yeah, it's a temptation. My dream <laughs> would be if Universal Audio, if anybody out there in Universal <laughs> Audio land listen to me, <laughs> that would be pretty amazing. Would write a, write a console that's dedicated to the to the needs of maybe podcasters and voice actors. Yep, that would be super amazing. You know, just a, a, an interface that makes sense to the brain of someone who's doing voice acting. Right. You know, and, and, and just has the features and settings that only you need. That would be pretty amazing. Yeah. It's called a Focusrite 2i2. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Essentially, yeah. <laughs> true, or or true. a solo. It's like, you know, yeah. don't eat the, the... Again, it's temptation because all of the stuff was not designed for voiceover. And then people were like, well, this makes me sound great. And I do that. Forget all that. You want We're not all Joe Cipriano doing promo. That's right. And Joe Cipriano just sounds great because he's Joe Cipriano. Right. Anyway. Um, second question. Is there another option for declicking other than RX-8? Since we're only using it to take out mouth clicks, is it really something I need to... Um, is this something that's used only in post or can it be set to do this while recording something yes and, um, yes and don't <laughs> yeah you definitely don't want to record through a mouth declicker because those things screw up your oh boy audio a lot so you don't want to ever destructively record your audio through a declicker um other yeah other than rx8 yeah there's acon acon a acon digital they have a declicking algorithm, so they're not the only ones out there. Well, Audition has a declicking algorithm. Audition does, yeah. Audition has a, and, and sometimes it works pretty, pretty darn well. Yeah, I've played with it, so yeah. I see. I I see now again. My philosophy is everything's physical, and we don't talk to other human beings through a declicker. And the only reason you hear mouth clicks is because your mic proximity might be a tad close. You're really close <laughs> like, and you're listening through headphones. And you're and you're like, yeah, exactly. And most people aren't. And you know, usually when you send in a file, if it's like yeah, that's a bit of a problem. Some people just seem to be a little clickier than others. And mm -hmm. I have and I have been instructing people that look, it's more important to keep yourself hydrated and not over project and not overemphasize certain syllables. Uh, you know, they, they have a tendency to start off a sentence louder and you can see it on the waveform. It's like, no, keep it nice and even. If you're relaxed, if your tongue is relaxed, um, uh, it shouldn't be a problem. And generally it's a hydration problem more than anything else. You know, I'm really clicky. Well, yeah. Hydration and stress. Yeah. Stress. Definitely. You know, mm -hmm. so, uh, important. And if you don't have to use it, 
don't. And, you know, if it's for auditions and stuff like that, I wouldn't worry about it too much unless you're really, really clicky. But let us determine that. I think so, most people are more sensitive to their own mouth clicks that they hear yeah. than anything else. Like once you hear those mouth clicks as an actor, it's super distracting to you. But to me as a listener, yeah, there are cases where the mouth noise is overpowering. But yeah. most of the time, it isn't. Most of the time, somebody says to me, they have a problem with mouth clicking. I usually listen to it and go, not eh, really. Not really that bad. Same with sibilance. A lot of people say they sound really sibilant. I'm like, not really. It's just there's a little prominence of, of, of a brightness in the mic. We can EQ that, EQ that out a little bit, and you're fine. But it's not. It, most people, once they hear it, they can't unhear it. It's your, your, own, your, your, own, your, your own worst critic. So. Absolutely. That's why you need meta ears with your, if you're really not sure what something is supposed to sound like, let somebody who does know, like George or I, yeah. listen to it. I mean, because if, if you're trying to create audio to please your own ears, you got to remember, you don't hire you. And you also probably haven't spent as many years as we have listening through our own environments, our own systems that we know extremely well. Um, I had somebody recently tell me that the audio settings I came up with sounded kind of muddy and muffled to them. And I didn't immediately say, well, you're wrong. I just said, well, what are you monitoring through? Maybe it could be their monitoring system. And, they, and I said, if you've got headphones and speakers, try both and tell me what you think. Long story short, they listened through their headphones and they were like, oh, yeah. That sounds the way you described it. And I was like, yeah, well, the problem is your monitoring environment wasn't, isn't tuned very well. Right. Your speakers are a little bit boomy and bass heavy. And that's very, very common with studio monitors in a home environment. And that's, what's getting you in trouble. So anyway, exactly. moving on, David Kressler had a question about flack. Flack. Um, flack. <laughs> Don't give uh, us any going, flack, man. Yeah. Stop giving us flack. <laughs> I was going to audition for a publishing company for audiobooks. When they requested the downloaded files be in FLAC format. What is this and where do I get this at? Um, this is not Og Vorbis. <laughs> right, right. So FLAC is, uh, I don't remember what the acronym is, but it's a lossless audio codec. Something lossless audio codec. Um, and basically what it means is instead of an MP3 audio file that degrades the audio a little bit, depending on the settings a lot, depending, you know, depending on how it's set up, um, a FLAC audio file, it will be smaller than the wave file, maybe a half to a third the size, but bigger with than absolutely MP3. no audible audio, uh, loss. So MP3 is a lossy format and then a FLAC is a non lossy <laughs> format. Yeah. That's what they call it. Um, certainly not common. The idea being that they're getting the best possible audio quality without you having to send them a full size wave file. So instead of sending them 400 megabyte files, you can send them maybe 200 megabyte files. Like that's so gonna make a big difference. Yeah, It's not a big difference. I'm pretty sure most recording softwares these days have a FLAC uh, file format save mode. Um, I know, I'm pretty sure Twisted Wave does. I, he didn't say what DAW he uses, but check in your DAW. And if you can't find it, then go online, look for something called Switch, which I think probably has it's a, it's a utility that will save anything in any other format you can think of. So look for switch. Exactly. Alrighty. Next. Jeff Holden. Jeff. He says, my voiceover booth walk-in closet. Well, what is it? Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's three feet wide by six feet, six and a half feet long by 10 feet high. Ooh, not bad. That's a, you know, I hope he has some shelves there. Uh, I have a, Shelf built at waist level into a wall on one end with the microphone, monitor, keyboard, and mouse sitting on top of the shelf. By doing this, I have effectively cut the height of my booth in half. Okay. Will I get more out of the booth if I lower the shelf to desk height? So um, I have a shelf built at waist level. Okay, that makes sense. With the microphone at monitor. Da, da, da. It has nothing to do with what's going on above because your mic is there. And it's and, right. and actually a desk, if it's a solid desk, is going to re, is going to be reverberant anyway. Which is yeah, why you're not going to get more out of the booth by lowering the shelf. Right. The only way you'd have problems with the shelf is if it was actually above the mic. Right, and that could cause reflections back down off the bottom of the shelf, 
that wouldn't be good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't think you're effectively cutting the height of your booth in half at all because the shelf's only what a foot deep. Right. But the booth is six and a half feet long. So yeah, I don't think you're really effectively cutting in half at all. Eh, really, and the only way to find out, Jeff, is to let us listen. Yeah, experiment Let's, or let, send us a sound check. Yeah, uh, and one last question here. Well, two questions from Carl Gillette. Uh, this is a very similar questions. This is I converted a walk step in closet into a studio. It's three and a half deep, five feet wide, and I use the existing shelves to make a drop ceiling at six feet with about two feet of annular space above. Annular. Ooh. Does that mean like a cavity? I guess so. Okay. And, uh, I gotta Google that. Yeah. In general, would, would it be worth opening up that space to add about 30 cubic feet? Probably not. At least from the way I look at things, you always want to try and reduce the acoustic size of a room. If there's not a lot of treatment up there and it's going to create reflection space. So, I mean, if he's got a drop down, it's sort of like having a cloud and preventing the sound from bouncing all the way up. Yeah, annular is an adjective referring to complex craters that have uplifted central structures surrounded by an annular trough and a fractured rim. <laughs> I'm sure there's a way to use that word correctly, and then I'm not doing it. That's what I got out of the dictionary. But um, I, I would usually a better, a higher ceiling is almost better almost always better in my experience um so it wouldn't be such a bad thing i don't know what that exists well you said that the shelf is a making a drop ceiling well he's got shelves and then he used he used this the shelves on both sides to create to put a, something across both sides so it's so there's a big there's a big cavity above that right that's right well as, as long as what is making that cavity is porous like not Big, big figs of wood, but is actually like an acoustical panel that right. sound can pass through. That would actually work really well, probably. Right. You know, because it makes a sort of a huge cavity, like a bass trap, where sound can kind of go up there and bounce around and then get reabsorbed on the way back. So. And then he says, I've added two layers of 5 8 inch sheet rock to help with soundproofing and before adding the acoustic foam. I put a layer of foam under carpet on the walls. Is that possibly creating too much frequency attenuation? Uh, only That's an interesting idea. Uh, yeah. I've never heard of putting foam under a carpet. Yeah, I'm generally floors don't generally don't cause a problem. I think he means on the walls. Uh, I put a layer of foam under a carpet on the walls. Oh, so he's got foam on the walls and then carpet, carpet on the wall on top of the foam. That's well, really interesting. Well, you're always saying that carpet tends to not attenuate high frequencies very well, or it doesn't take low frequencies. It mo yeah, it mostly does the high frequencies. And then yeah. he adds foam, which also soaks up high frequencies. I, I don't, you know, Carl, theoretically, it's probably okay. Guess what? Guess what we're going to tell you? Okay. We got to hear it. <laughs> Hearing is believing. If it sounds good, it is good. Right. You hear us say it every episode. <laughs> We got to hear it. But um, I think theoretically what you're describing could work pretty well. I'm sometimes totally surprised at how some people's bizarrely set up studios sound great. And sometimes the ones that sound like they're done right when I hear the audio sound pretty bad. <laughs> so it can be really difficult sometimes. Absolutely. To nail down. All right. Lots of good questions. Lots of good discussion. Yeah. All righty. But I can smell dinner. Uh, I'm sure the missus is like, what are you doing out there? She's like, Don't oh, wrap I, I forgot it's Monday night. Yes, it's my Mahjong night. <laughs> You've got Mahjong night. This is my Mahjong night. <laughs> anyway, next week on this very show, the one and only Will Lyman will be here. Super cool. Uh, this is going to be, he's, I, I hear he's a really nice guy, uh, a legend in, in voiceover. If you, if you watch Frontline on PBS and other PBS shows, and of course, the voice behind the most interesting man in the world commercials for Dos Equis. Good campaign. Great campaign. And um, and he's, do, he's done some other cool acting stuff, which uh, we want to talk to him about. Cool, uh, cool. Yeah. And then on February 1st, Debbie Derryberry will be joining us again. All right. So that's a great stuff. Who are our donors this week? Oh, there's a good list of names here. Healthy one. Christopher Epperson, Sarah Borges, Philip Sapir, Trey Mosley, Shelley Avellino, Thomas Pinto, Larry Hudson, Natasha Merchevka, 
You got Brian it right. Page, <laughs> George Whittem, that's my dad, Rob Ryder, Patty Gibbons, Diana Birdsall, Stephanie Sutherland, Shauna Pennington Baird, Antland Productions, Martha Kahn, and Don Griffith. Yeah. Whoa. I, yeah. I got a New Year's card from John Florian, our good friend at VoiceOver Me Extra. Me too. And, and it says, you know, from John and Martha. And I'm thinking, did I miss something? Is, he is this to a Martha? No, his wife's name is Nancy. Right. And I write to him like, what? Oh, it's Martha Kahn. Who Martha does, Kahn. Um, who works yes. with him at, at VoiceOver Extra. So. That's right. Sorry, Martha. Martha, yes, I can. She's awesome. She's a great gal. Uh, yeah. We need to thank our sponsors, of course. Uh, Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. VoiceOver Extra. Source Elements. VOHeroes.com. VoiceActorWebsites.com. And JMC Demos. Yes. Our thanks to Jeff Holman for doing Yeoman Job in the chat room tonight, which I'm sure was somewhat challenging at times. Mm -hmm. uh, and our amazing technical director, who probably has been sweating buckets all night, and that's Sumer Leo. <laughs> Getting it done, despite you never know what's going on in the background here. But it, right. work, but it works, and she's one of the reasons it does. And, right, right. and Lee Penny for simply being Lee Penny. Well, that's going to do it for us this week. We'll be back next week. If you got questions for us, write to us at the guys. Put that up there, Sue. The guys at V-O-B-S dot TV. There it is. And uh, we'll answer those questions. We love hearing from you guys. That's why we're here. And we're here to help you with your home voiceover studios. Anyway, look, if it sounds good. It is good. I'm Dan Leonard. I'm George Whittem. And this is voiceover. Body shop. Or VO. B S Tech Talk Tech Talk Tech Talk Tech Talk Tech Talk Tech Talk Talk Have a good week. Good night, everybody. Oh, there's the theme.